Is the global recession already here and are the markets already in panic mode? Welcome to Macro Money. That's the question we're going to be asking ourselves today on a very interesting day for markets. This is Ilya Spivak, head of global macro here at Tasty Live. What an interesting response to otherwise pretty chipper economic data. We're going to take a look at all of it in just a second with a view to what is coming up tomorrow, uh, which will be the release of minutes from July's FOMC meeting. Uh, and consider whether what's going on here is indeed the sign that the markets are starting to roll over, the sign that these minutes, if they were to strike anything like the hawkish tone elsewhere in Fed commentary, could have the potential to trigger something truly liquidating in its effect on stock markets and continue to uh, create support for uh, the US dollar. We're also going to take a look at which very beaten down asset in recent weeks might well benefit and have a turnaround around this narrative. That, of course, the potential for a very interesting trading opportunity with attractive risk reward. So let's start at the beginning. We have here a uh, situation that begins with the retail sales number. We've been looking and waiting to see what this would be. This is where we started the week, and we can see here a much stronger outcome than expected. Retail sales up 0.7% in July. That's against expectations of a 0.4% rise. So almost double the expectation. And as you can see here, much higher in relative terms uh, than we've seen in recent months. It gets better. If we look at the year-on-year -year number, we can see that uh, a rise of 3.2% is actually the strongest increase since February's 5% percent rise. That was that acceleration of the U.S. economy that saw the drive up in yields that ultimately gave us the SVB crisis, to just give a bit of context. But as we can see, the trend in retail sales since that very aggressive post-COVID peak where year-on-year -year growth actually hit north of 40 percent in the adjustment after utter lockdown, this seems to be a bit of bottoming. It seems to be a bit of a turn back higher. So needless to say, one might surmise the markets love this. And why wouldn't they? 70%, give or take, of U.S. economic growth is household consumption. Retail sales being up, well, that's very good news for U.S. growth. Surely that's good news for earnings. Surely then that is good news for Wall Street. And maybe not. Very ugly day on stock markets today. Sharp decline across the major indices. Looking at uh, what's going on with uh, the S&P now as we get uh, deeper toward the close here, uh, S&P 500 on pace to close down 1.15%. That's scary by any stretch of the imagination. So why is it that we seemingly have supportive economic data and yet the market doesn't like it. Surely this has something to do with this higher for longer Fed situation. Maybe that's what the issue is. Market looks at the retail sales number, goes, ah, well, rate hikes. That's not a good thing. But that's not quite so easy an explanation. Because looking at the two-year note here, we can see it's actually up a bit. 
very little, to be sure. But this is not yield surging, clearly. If it was, well, then maybe we'd be breaking down the recent lows in this two-year note, and we're not. Is it any better at the long end? Not really. The 10-year note, same thing. Holding recent lows, not really breaking out. So what is the matter here? Why is it that stocks are aggressively down, yet yields are not racing anywhere? Bonds are relatively well supported. The dollar, of course, still strong. Why is it that these numbers and the overall back story, why is it reflecting in this way? Well, let's consider what this might be, especially as these FOMC minutes come into view. It's probably right to say that in the Fed's calculus, these kinds of numbers this kind of resilience from consumers is an issue for ongoing disinflation. We can see that here. Much of the remaining inflationary impulse seems to be coming from the service sector, exclusive of food and exclusive of energy. The good side, we can see, has been squeezed to next to nothing. Food inflation still is holding up a bit, but it's a very small part of this whole. Energy is at this point a disinflationary impulse. It's actually pulling prices lower. The big wedge still holding things up, as we've discussed, uh, of course, for months at this point, and as the Fed has made no secret of asserting time and time again, is core services. So where is inflation coming from? in core services. Well, we can see here a familiar story. The service sector employs anywhere between 70 to 80% of US workers. So the main story there seems to be wages, and we can see why. There continues to be a significant mismatch between labor supply and demand. We can track this story clearly. That giant spike in the blue bars that you see toward the middle of the screen there, right around the start of 2020, is of course COVID. That's labor supply starting to vastly outstrip demand. And of course it is. Everybody gets sent home, businesses get closed, Everything's on lockdown. Tons of labor, no demand for it. As the situation starts to improve, you can see that oversupply starts to diminish right up until around the middle of 2021, when it flips and we actually start to see labor deficit. We start to see labor supply undershooting demand as the economy opens and searches to restaff. We peak at just about a 6 million worker shortage at the beginning of last year. We're at about 3.6 million now. That, of course, is a very significant improvement, almost half. But a 3.6 million deficit in the labor market is vastly worse than where it was before the pandemic. You can see there that right around the beginning, the first half of 2018, is when this flipped from surplus, a modest one, to a deficit, a modest one. The worse that deficit got from early 2018 right up to the pandemic is about one and a half million workers. We are more than double that in deficit right now. And so, not surprisingly, how do businesses compete for workers when there is a shortage? Well, the same way that you compete for anything else when there's a shortage. On price, you have to pay more if you're going to get the scarce resource. And so, not surprisingly, much of the 
lingering inflation here is the service sector. And much of that is this labor shortage because wages feed into the cost of all things. It is that much more expensive for service providers who are the main employers of labor. And so they're passing on these costs. If it's more expensive to pay wages, well, then the price of the services themselves will reflect that. From the Fed's perspective, this is the, the thing standing in the way between getting from what is now an inflation rate of 3.2, 3.3% back in the direction of two. This is the last mile of disinflation that they need to squeeze. Of course, lots of progress made already. We were uh, well north of 9%, 9.1 as a matter of fact, as of June of last year. We are now just above three. That's a tremendous victory uh, so far. But this next mile ought to be quite a bit harder. Whereas you can mend supply chains and costs come down. We saw that in the PPI numbers that came out last week. The costs of moving goods around the U.S. economy have dropped precipitously. As a matter of fact, for intermediate goods, they're actually in deflationary territory at this point. So the cost of moving intermediate goods around the U.S. economy is actually falling. For final goods, it's very modestly positive, but well, well below historical norms. For the situation uh, on the global goods commerce side, those prices can adjust lower when demand falls apart. And we've seen that as well. We've seen the goods part of the inflation mix, as we just saw, and, and as we can see here, shrink to next to nothing. That's a response to Fed tightening. It's a response to uh, the improvement in those su supply chains. Wages are quite a bit different because wages don't adjust back down unless you fire people. It's generally not the case that at your annual salary re review, your employer says, well, we're going to reduce your salary to adjust for inflation. No, typically those wages that are negotiated during inflationary periods, that's the adjustment. The adjustment is higher because inflation is going up. And of course, through this inflationary uh, period that we've seen here over the past year and a half, two years, there's been quite a few salaries locked in at very high levels. So, from the Fed's perspective, in so much as you are not going to come up with 3.6 million in additional labor supply on a one and a half to two year timeline, it's probably not uh, a way to even do that, even if one were to imagine a very unlikely immigration overhaul. Well, then the only way to adjust to this is from the demand side. You have to hurt demand such that it aligns with supply, or at least aligns closer. So the pressure on costs is relieved. Does the Fed have the appetite to do this? Well, we've looked at the relationship between inflation and expectations for it in the markets, the yellow bars there, the two-year break-even, the orange line uh, of you on short-term uh, inflation expectations from the swaps market, that's the one-year USD inflation swap. And we can see the market is still basically priced for perfection. What does that mean? Well, on current setting, what this means is that the Fed gets to its target in two years' time, assuming nothing goes wrong. So we just get to the 2% inflation target within the Fed's 
usual policy window of about one to two years. Nothing at all can happen to throw the Fed off course or else we're already in the wrong direction because we have zero leeway here at all. We've argued here on macro money uh, that this is not the place where the Fed wants to be. They would much rather these expectations be lower so the Fed could cut into the target so that expectations, which seem to be leading overall CPI by about two months, that these expectations would dip under two, and then the Fed could cut, providing stimulus to the economy and lifting expectations into the target at the same time. That would be ideal, one would think. But as it happens, we can see here expectations have really idled for the better part of the year, certainly the second quarter onward. This, of course, presents an issue because in that very same period of time, there's actually been a hawkish shift in the Fed policy outlook as expectations for rapid cuts this year were taken off the board with the containment of the SVB-led banking uh, crisis and with the passing of the U.S. debt ceiling fiasco without any kind of major consternation. So from the Fed's perspective, those hawkish adjustments in policy expectations were plainly ineffective at restarting disinflation, at least from looking at expectations. And so, from the Fed's perspective, then, there's very little scope to cut. Now, from the market's perspective, they still expect a meaningful easing cycle to arrive in the second quarter of next year. But what we've seen over the past week, week and a half, is an adjustment as the markets start to consider, well, maybe the Fed is going to have to be in higher for longer mode. Maybe what they're looking at here is enough to perhaps hold rates higher, if not raise them for longer and, and to delay this, this cutting cycle. We can see that in the way that the market implied policy curve has shifted. So we can see here from the six month out point onward, the one year, the two year, the three year expectation steeper than it was even a week ago. But no real movement yet in the front. So the odds of a September hike, say, or a November one, haven't meaningfully shifted. We can see that breakdown right here. So the odds of a hike in September at this point, just 11%. The highest we see for further tightening is the odds uh, at 38% for a rise in November. Then things fade. The odds of a cut in March have certainly fallen. They were close to 80% a week ago. They're about half that now. But we still have a cut all but fully baked in in May, 92%. A second hike fully baked in by July, a third one by September of next year, and a fourth one by December. So we can see, if we look at that December 18th meeting at the implied rate column, it's 4.24. That's down from 5.35 now. So if we consider we're in the five and a quarter to five and a half range now, and we're supposed to be in the four and a quarter ish area by the end of next year, then we're looking at between 100 and 125 basis points in cuts for next year that the market is anticipating. If the Fed is going to have a higher for longer perspective, and if this translates, especially after retail sales data like this, in the minutes, and in subsequent commentary, well, then we have to start to scale some of this down.
Maybe it starts later. Maybe it's a shallower easing cycle. Maybe there's even a greater chance for a hike sometime before the calendar even turns to 20, uh, 2024. So why isn't the response to retail sales today then a more obvious higher for longer yields up sort of thing? Why are yields anchored here? For that matter, why isn't gold falling? It tends to do the worst when yields reflect a more hawkish Fed and the dollar is rising. It seems to be holding near recent lows. It's certainly not rallying here. That much is certain. But what is it that the markets aren't catching about this being an impetus for the Fed to go harder on inflation and thereby drive up yields? Well, we've talked in detail yesterday and over the, the recent weeks about the idea that the global economy seems to be increasingly on the precipice of recession. We see here on uh, the JP Morgan uh, global composite PMI number, there was at the start of this year a bit of a ramp up on the service side, which has allowed the economy to accelerate even as the manufacturing side is in contraction territory. That's below 50 in the logic of PMIs. Under 50 is contraction, above 50 is expansion. And the further you go in each direction, the faster that is. So. As we see here, the composite number crest and start to come down over the past several months to a lower reading above 50. What that's telling us is the global economy is growing, but at a slowing rate. Looking at the components of what is most critical here, we can see it's really basically three economies that account for over half of global growth at face value, China, the Eurozone, and the U.S. And it's actually more than that, because much of the rest of world in the 43% gray area there are vendors dependent on demand from the other three. Think about Central Europe being dependent on demand from Western Europe, the core of the Eurozone. Much of Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand, with them dependent on demand from China. Countries like Mexico and Canada, dependent on demand from the US. All of them are in that 43%. So the impact from the 57% that is just those three economies is actually much greater. And the story in China is one of an economy unable to restart after COVID lockdowns. We've talked extensively about that before. The external demand that they were powered by as a critical node of value add in the global supply chain just has not returned to levels that were there before the pandemic. That makes sense. They opened up a year later than their uh, most important end demand markets, forcing those markets to diversify. Not only that, but uh, the trade war aspect of this has meant that there is an increasingly uh, contentious uh, situation between China and its main trading partners, not just in the US, but also in Europe, with adjacent countries now uh, feeling like they too can start to assert themselves, like Korea and Japan. In the Eurozone, if we're not in, in a recession already, then we're certainly a hair away from one. The latest PMI. Uh, data seemingly suggesting that uh, the regional economy already shrank last month. That would extend weakness uh, after Germany's economy shrank in the second quarter. Germany, of course, the largest economy in the Eurozone. So the U.S. consumer, firm though the U.S. consumer is looking at this retail sales data, was really the last line of defense. 
against the global recession, which if the Fed is pointedly aiming to slow inflation, it is going to degrade. If the problem for the Fed is the U.S. labor market and elevated wage levels being sticky and holding up inflation north of target, and if the aim of higher for longer, more hawkish policy is to puncture that, well, that punctures the resilience of the U.S. consumer. And if the U.S. consumer is that which prevents the global economy from slipping into recession because the Eurozone and China are already weak, and it's the U.S. holding up the entire boat, well, then the Fed is on course to bring the risk of that global recession that much closer. And perhaps this is why yields aren't going up in response to this data, though stocks are down and the dollar is stronger. From the dollar's perspective, we, will, of course, looked at this before. This is uh, the dollar smile, where we can see that the dollar tends to do well when the U.S. economy does well and when it does poorly, just not when it's middling. Why is that? Well, when the U.S. economy does poorly, the world's largest economy, of course, has a tendency to drag everybody else along. And so there is a liquidation from growth-based cyclical so-called risky assets. That liquidation tends to benefit the most liquid kind of cash because that's the cash that's the most able to absorb all of that capital exiting markets. So not surprisingly, the U.S. dollar benefits in a liquidation cash-out kind of a scenario. But the other element here the one that's been missing, because, of course, we have been seeing this sense of a higher for longer narrative for about a week. It's today that's a little bit different. The element that's been missing here is the yen. The yen has been vastly beaten down because yields have been going up, just not today, around this higher for longer narrative. But if there is liquidation, and if that liquidation starts to smell like global recession risk is hitting a level of fever pitch, well, then it's a bit of a different story. The dollar still benefits from liquidation, but yields don't really have scope to keep going higher because there is an expectation that if there is this more insidious turn in the business cycle, that yields probably don't go up very much. That some of those cuts now baked into the second quarter of next year and thereafter, that they might actually make sense if there is a bad enough downturn. And the yen in so much as Japan hasn't had interest rates very far away from zero for, for decades at this point, the yen is very much a creature of yields. We can see here that as global yields rise, there's an average there of the US, the Eurozone, the UK, and Australia in the dark line, and uh, the Japanese yen in the red. As yields rise, the yen falls. This is because rising yields offer the opportunity to borrow for next to nothing in yen to then reinvest or to buy assets that yield more and to capture that yield. This is called the carry trade strategy. Well, in an environment where those assets that might have been bought with borrowed yen start falling, the people employing that strategy start to exit those positions which means buying back the yen they've borrowed, covering those loans. That would translate to a yen going higher. So if, in fact, the dynamics that we're seeing here today are indicative of global recession becoming the operational narrative, if the hot retail sales number is beckoning a hawkish tone from the likes of the FOMC minutes announcement that we see massaged 
of course it is. This is not exactly going to be a retelling of exactly what happened at the meeting. The Fed, of course, knows this is a guidance piece. So if they signal more hawkish in this document when it hits tomorrow, and if subsequent commentary at the Jackson Hole Symposium next week uh, at the uh, September FOMC drives that point home, and the expectation is U.S. economic strength is a magnet for Fed tightening, undermining the resilience of the global economy to recession, the difference from what we've seen recently ought to be it's not just the U uh, the US dollar rallying it's not just stocks falling it's the yen reversing from these recent lows and so we can see here the yen has been quite beaten down making for potentially a very interesting opportunity for a trend reversal and that is macro money for today. If you're watching this on YouTube, hop on over to the comments and share your thoughts. Are we going to see the Fed cut rates when we start next year? And is the yen going to turn around here? What do you think about global recession risk? How likely is that near term? Share your thoughts and uh, extra points if you can uh, explain why you think the Fed will or won't cut, why the yen will or won't rise from these levels. Macro Money is uh, going to address these comments. Uh, we are here uh, every single week, Monday through Thursday. So we'll wrap up what you guys uh, are thinking as we talk about all of this stuff into the show. I'm also on with uh, Chris Vecchio, head of Futures and Forex here, right before Macro Money for Overtime, where we try to figure out what happened in markets on any given day and perhaps even see what could be next. I'm back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays, writing for the News and Insights section of TastyLive.com, and opining on Twitter, yes, Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining, everybody. See you tomorrow.